Fantastic. Um, so welcome everyone this morning to the launch of From Carbon Footprints to Cultural Influence, Engaging Live Music Audiences on Travel Choices. Uh, this is a research project that's been running since the early summer this year. It's been supported by the Centre for Climate Change and Social Transformation as Impact Fund. Um, so for those of you who don't know what CAST is, the Centre for Climate Change and Social Transformations, um, CAST looks at social transformations needed to produce a low carbon and sustainable society, and they focus on four key areas around material consumption, heating and cooling, food and diet, and transport and mobility. And it's really the changes um, that are going to reach into people's lives and how we can support those. Um, so the research has been led by Dr. Adam Corner of Climate Communication Culture and Bryony Ladder, who's a researcher at the Centre for Climate Change and Social Transformations and also part of the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research. Um, with inputs from me. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chiara. I'm music lead at Judy's Bicycle and we're a charity that's been helping to mobilize climate action in the arts and in the music industry for 15 years. Um, Brian and Adam, do you briefly want to introduce yourselves and say hello as well? Yeah, I'll pop in first. Um, so I'm Bryony. Um, as Chiara said, I'm a researcher at CAST. I mainly work in public engagement with climate change. So that's been across multiple areas, including COP26, um, young people, um, also worked with the older generation, um, and also more creative projects such as this one, and also one that I worked on with Adam earlier in the year about how arts and culture events can catalyze engagement with climate change. Hi everyone, great to see so many names names popping up in the in the chat. Welcome. Um, yeah, I'm Adam. I have worked on climate communication and public engagement with climate change for around about 15 years in different ways um, as part of a university team at Cardiff University um, for the charity Climate Outreach. Um, I was one of the one of the founding directors of the, of the co-directors of the Cast Centre when it was established through the role that I had at Climate Outreach. Um, yeah, and, and I've been working independently for the last 18 months, two years or so, um, operating as climate communication culture, as Kiara said. So really thinking about how to apply what we know about um, climate communication and public engagement um, in um, creative cultural spaces. Brilliant. Thanks both. Um, so I think looking back at how the project came about, I think before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there were a lot of conversations very long overdue around how the music industry could respond to the climate crisis. And although they've been sort of bubbling along for a long time, they were definitely getting a lot louder. And the disruption of the pandemic in a lot of ways created a, a new kind of space for artists, for promoters, for people working in the live music industry to start reflecting a bit on what it is we do, how we do it, why we do it in the way that we do it, um, and in particular thinking about uh, the impacts of live music. And audience travel is a key piece of that for reasons we'll look at a little bit closer in just a moment. Um, so just to give a bit of an overview of the research, um, we hosted two roundtables with music industry representatives, one focused at events taking place on greenfield sites, so a way from your standard public transport connections and a little bit outside cities and urban centers, and one focused at events taking place within urban settings, um, so within cities and towns. Um, and we, in those roundtables, we looked at what people have tried to shift audience travel behaviors, where the pain points are, what's worked, um, and also where people see the opportunities for change. Um, and Adam and Bryony took all of that brilliant insight and also did a little bit of a literature review on the key social science and climate communications literature and background that they know so well, thinking about how that might translate into this live music context. Um, and they also went off and did some on-site surveying of audiences arriving at Shambhala Festival. So a big thanks to Chris and Shambhala Festival for um, making that happen. Um, and the result is this report, uh, which you can now download uh, from the web. You can see the link in the slides, and I'm just going to stick it in the chat as well. Um, so hopefully after the webinar finishes, you'll have a, a moment to go through that and um, reflect a bit on what it is that you might do and want to do next um, around the content and suggestions. So 
thinking about why audience travel, um, it is a huge part of an event's carbon footprint. Um, and we've known that for a really long time. We've known that since uh, the first piece of research that Julie's Bicycle did with the Environmental Change Institute at Oxford University way back in 2007. Um, it sort of came up as, as one of the industry's hotspots, er, hotspot areas of impact. Um, and we know for greenfield events and festivals, um, it can be up to 75, 80% of the carbon footprint, uh, depending a bit on what all you include and measure, but it's definitely the largest uh, source of impact. Uh, and for larger city centre venues, um, it's still often around 40 to 50%. Um, again, still often the single largest source of impact for that type of venue. Um, so when we're making these commitments to climate action in the live music industry, um, it we can't ignore it, we can't leave it out, even though it is a tough nut to crack for a range of reasons um, that include it's outside the immediate control of live music event organizers. Um, it's sort of down to audiences making choices. Um, we know that there's a lot of nervousness about telling people what to do before they actually get to your event um, and sort of feeling like, you know, you're wagging your finger at people. Um, and also we know that there's a lack of infrastructure to enable people to travel differently in ways that are safe, affordable and possible. Um, and that's definitely some of the pain points that also came up in the roundtables. Um, and we'll go through how that shapes some of the recommendations in a moment. Um, but as well as all of those challenges, we think that there are real major opportunities here. Um, it is a gateway to engage audiences as agents of change, and it is a way to accelerate progress in cutting carbon. Um, and that's really important to think about as well in the context of what we need to achieve in the, in the UK more broadly. Um, so transport has been the largest emitting greenhouse gas emission sector in the UK since 2016. Um, it produced a fourth of the UK's emissions in 2020. Um, basically, we reduced the emissions that come from electricity a lot um, and have made absolutely no dent in transport emissions whatsoever. Um, it's a really huge challenge and policy issue at the moment. Um, and of course, the, the COVID-19 restrictions um, did lead to some reductions for that period that we were in lockdown. But before that, emissions more or less stayed static because even as things like fuel efficiency might have been um, improving, basically we're just traveling more and we're traveling further. Um, and some of that has to be reversed. Um, if we think about the UK's net zero targets um, and look at sort of the, the Committee for Climate Change pathways, uh, what we call surface transport, so things like road travel, traveling on trains and so on and so forth, has to go to actual zero before 2050. Um, so that's a huge area of social transformation and also one of the reasons why CAS looks at transport and mobility. Um, the other interesting thing to keep in mind is that um, according to the National Transport Survey, leisure activities are responsible for the majority of distance traveled, not commuting or school trips. And again, with um, music events being a, a big contributor to leisure travel um, and one of the reasons people travel within the UK, that means there is a real opportunity here for us to make a difference. Um, so it does, it matters to the event sector, it matters to the climate targets being set by venues, events and others in the music industry, but it also matters because it's this huge opportunity to mobilize that cultural footprint that artists and events have looking outwards at climate transformation in wider society. Uh, and on that note, I'm going to hand over to Bryony. Thanks, Kiara. Um, so just going to give a bit of the overview in terms of communications and engagement. So engaging people with climate change is important because it means that people are involved in decisions that affect them, gives more legitimacy and a social mandate for decision making as well. And there's a lot of existing communications and public engagement research out there that campaigners, practitioners and that the live music industry can draw on as well. So some of those areas that would be helpful to have an understanding of are things like trusted messengers. So who do people trust? And that can be generally, but also on climate change or broader environmental issues. And appropriate messengers could look quite different for different groups of people as well. And knowing what kind of communications might work well across a broad range of people and where you instead might need to be more targeted and use tailored communication is important. So framing issues in different ways that could be using different wording or just a different approach. 
So understanding people's values and identities and drawing on those. And also having two-way communication and conversations with people. So not just kind of a one-way stream of information is important. Um, and as Kiara has already alluded to in CAST, we really think about people um, of agents of change. And what that means is that transformations to a more sustainable society can really only be achieved if they're undertaken with support and involvement with people that will be affected and that people can help to create change in a lot of different ways. So that could be as peers, citizens, colleagues, voters. Um, so not just thinking of people um, as kind of the audience as consumers. And some people's behaviour can and should change to address climate change. So behaviours at scale, collective action does add up, but it's also important to consider how events and their audiences can work together to catalyse faster climate progress. So communications on its own isn't enough. It has to be tied to action and changes that matter. Um, and the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research, Equilibrium and others have set that out. And we've included a lot of practical examples in our report. But, to, but how to get these actions and changes to land as effectively as possible is where comms and engagement really comes in and can help with that. Next slide, please. So Kiara has already given a good overview of this, um, but just to recap, in terms of how we approach the project, um, we kind of did it in a few different ways, bringing together existing literature on climate communications, um, seeing what's already out there, some of the things that I touched upon in the previous slide, for example, that was presented in the two roundtables that we held um, across Greenfield and urban events, um, where we focused on kind of sharing barriers and challenges to reducing the environmental impact of audience travel, but also looking at opportunities for positively influencing that. And then once we'd started to develop some recommendations for the report, we attended Shambhala Festival to kind of road test some of those ideas. And that was really small um, anonymous survey with festival attendees as they were arriving on the first day. So asking a few questions about fairness, festival action about sustainable travel, and also perceptions about travel choices outside of the festival and campaigning. Um, and from that, we developed the report with our five recommendations, including examples, evidence, and practical suggestions within that as well. So now we're just going to run through each of the five recommendations from the report in turn and explain a bit of them in more detail. So I'll hand over to Adam to take us through the first two. Thanks, Bryony, and, and Kira for setting out like the context for, for, for these really clearly, I think. Um, so yeah, just to, just to sort of reiterate, this is coming from um, really trying to listen to what people told us in those roundtables about challenges and opportunities, lots of challenges, I guess, um, and then thinking about how what, what, what we know about public engagement communication can contribute to trying to um, address some of these challenges or, or take advantage of, of the opportunities that are there around um, better engaging audiences on, on, on travel choices um, to, to, you know, to, to, to address the, the, that part of, a, of an event's carbon footprint, but, but also just to, to, to try and catalyze um, wider wider um, carbon carbon emission cuts through through the choices that audiences make in all sorts of different ways that's a kind of underlying theme i guess and we started yeah the, the first the first recommendation in the report is really just sort of picks up off of, of that phrase that that, that Bryony introduced there that's really key to the cast center's approach um which is that people and in this case audiences can be really powerful agents of change they're not just punters um the, 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 there are certainly more things that events can do themselves internally um, that can make the conditions under which audiences can make positive sustainable travel choices more possible, you know, um, secure bike storage or really stepping up on coach packages and incentivizing those. But it feels like one of the things that we heard consistently in our roundtables and is really like an industry wide challenge is the sort of infrastructure around live events and the challenges that that poses for creating the conditions where people can actually make sustainable choices in the first place. So our, our question is, can events and audiences do more to sort of actively work together um, to try and get through some of these impasses? Next slide, please. Um, 
yeah, because there are there are certainly examples of venues and events that have managed to work with local authorities or public transport providers to synchronize or provide the services that are needed so that people can can travel to and from events in a more sustainable way as possible. But it's it's hard. It's a tough one. Um, and so the question here, I think, is whether there's an opportunity to think about audiences um, as, as, as being a kind of partner in helping to voice the changes, the demands for what needs to happen um, through, for example, provision of, of the right kind of public transport um, and, to, and, to, and to speak together um, on those issues. There's a kind of shared zone of, of you know, investment and concern here for, for events to become more sustainable. So, so why can't audiences and events have that sort of shared voice out to external partners? And I think it is important to, you know, to just remember and realize that compared to almost any other sort of business or um, enterprise or undertaking festivals and, and, and much loved live music events have something special and not ordinary businesses um, and where we can mobilize audiences to mean to be not just audience members um, but as voters that politicians listen to um, or as customers that other businesses listen to there's there's real potential power there um, and I think there are there are, there are examples of this kind of approach happening um, during COVID-19, Music Venue Trust um, and the Save Our Venues campaign, you know, took, took this approach of reaching out to audiences to help voice, uh, you know, an economic or political demand where there was something shared, um, a shared love, you know, for, for something in common. Um, so, so the question is, can we, can we apply that to sort of climate change and sustainability and, and the needs that events have around travel choices? Obviously, it looks different for every event, for every venue in different places, but it feels like enough of an industry-wide challenge that if there was um, an industry-wide voice on um, what changes need to happen around events and for, 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 for sustainable travel infrastructure, the audiences can and, and should be like a powerful part of, of, of that voice. Next slide, please. Um, the second recommendation that we um, focus on in the report is, I guess, around how to sort of frame travel choices and whether they feel to audiences that they are um, being asked to make sort of individual sacrifices um, or to kind of inconvenience themselves, even if it is for kind of worthy reasons, worthy cause, um, or whether there's a way of presenting um, as Bryony said, um, sort of behavioural change at scale really does matter, it does add up, whether there's a way of presenting travel decisions as a kind of collective undertaking. Um, and we know from the social research that sits underneath this report that um, when people you know, feel that they're acting together as a group, as a collective, perceive themselves as a kind of um, in-group, then that sense of agency and efficacy, like we can do this, what we do matters, really helps to push things along. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, we all know this, right, from, from our own experiences. No one wants to have their specific decisions and choices micromanaged. Um, I feel like whenever you do talk to people, even when we were speaking to people um, at, at Shambhala Festival to road test some of these ideas, you know, just occasionally, even though we weren't saying, how did you get here? Um, you know, what, what, what mode of transport did you use? That wasn't the questions we asked. But even though we weren't asking that, so it does trigger a kind of, you know, a level of defensiveness. I think there's always a reason why, not always, but there can often be a reason why people can't in a particular situation make a particular choice. But if instead of focusing on, 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 on that kind of approach, um, campaigns around travel behaviours can really keep the focus collective, think about and visualise the impact of changes at scale, um, you know, creatively sort of show or set group um, targets um, that, you know, that can, that can show not only the impact that collective behaviours have, um, but also really sort of help to convey that shared sense of purpose and identity, I think, there's something really important around the social cues, the social norms that are provided when we see see for ourselves what other people think or what other people are doing. That really helps with our own, you know, motivation um, and enthusiasm to, you know, to make changes ourselves. There's a really nice example in the report that we, we heard about in our roundtables from Anjuna Beats, who've been trialing and sort of piloting ways to 
to creatively visualize the collective impact of audience travel choices at some of their events. Um, I always think like some of the most interesting um, social psychology research on climate change perceptions shows how we often misperceive what other people think. So we might underestimate how much people care about climate change, even though we care a lot, or we might, the classic one is, is for onshore wind. We underestimate how much support there is for onshore wind, even though there's really high support and has been for years. And that's a powerful cue in itself. Like if we think other people don't care, we think other people aren't acting, then it takes away our, our motivation. So um, this collective framing of, of group choices, I think is a really powerful way to, to present um, to present audience travel campaigns and to and to give that sort of group motivation and and, and, and social norm cues that are, that are so powerful. Back over to Bryony. Thanks. So looking at our third recommendation, we also recommend finding and amplifying human stories. So things that kind of show the change rather than focusing solely on facts and figures. And that's really about thinking what are the audience values that you can use to kind of frame climate communications for them. Next slide, please. So it's a bit of a communications truism, but knowing your audience is really important. And that's not just about their what their demographics are and kind of things like marketing preferences, but what do they actually care about? What does your audience all have in common? So there's some existing work out there that you can draw on for starting to understand things like this. For example, there was a recent report and survey called Turn Up the Volume, um, Music Fan Attitudes Towards Climate Change and Music, which suggested that music fans might be more engaged with environmental issues than the general public, although they did find that they had a low level of knowledge about music industry sustainability initiatives, but also found that live music attendees are especially willing to spend more on sustainable events. And you can also use resource, resources that aren't specific to music, such as the Britain Talks Climate Toolkit by Climate Outreach, to map different segments of the British public onto your audiences in terms of their engagement and attitudes towards climate change. And remember that the way you frame your communications is always a choice as well. So, for example, the incoming energy saving campaign from the UK government focuses on patriotism and money, but could have led on avoiding waste and all doing our fair share to use energy responsibly. So really consider what are the values of your audience and make sure you ground climate change and travel messages in those shared principles. So whether that's very broad or whether you do end up needing to kind of segment your audience a bit more. And as Adam mentioned as well, that might look very different for different festivals or events. It's not gonna be the same for everyone. And making sure to use the power of personal stories um, that can help to engage people. So showing positive experiences and action that people are taking to give initiatives that human face and kind of normalize different activities. Next slide, please. And moving on to the fourth recommendation, um, having a focus on fairness and feasibility. So when people perceive a climate policy or behavioral ask to be fair, they are more likely to support it. Next slide, please. So it's really important not to solve one problem, only to create another. Sustainable choices need to be inclusive and not worsen any inequalities. And this also came up in our roundtables as well. So whether that's affordability, safety or accessibility, um, it was really clear that sustainable travel really does need to be inclusive. And thinking about fairness or what people perceive to be fair, is one of the consistent factors influencing perceptions of climate change and sustainable behaviours. So fairness means different things to different people. Um, and as Adam said, not everyone will be able to um, or should be asked to change their behaviours, but some people definitely can. So carbon footprints are heavily skewed towards increasing disposable income. We know the wealthiest people in the world are responsible for a huge amount of um, emissions. So some people are able to change and would have a big impact. And our research at Shambhala found that for the most part, audiences think it is fair for festivals and live events to invite audiences to make more sustainable travel choices. And that was made up of about half who thought they was, that it was fair outright and about a third who thought it was only fair for audience members who could afford to or were able to. So 
the choices that some people make around travel really matter. And this all links back to the importance of understanding for your specific event, who is suitable to engage with um, and how they might perceive your communications or suggested actions. Um, so back to Adam for uh, recommendation five. Yeah, thanks, Bryony. So, so the fifth, fifth and final recommendation in the report, I guess, I guess, kind of does tie tie back maybe to the to the first one, um, where the focus was on how events and audiences could, you know, work in partnership to be voicing sort of external demands. I guess the fifth recommendation, um, and it picks up on this idea of of legacy impacts that the Cardiff University Festival Research Group has has talked about um, looking at the kind of sporting and, and cultural events that there is the potential for um, events where there's a kind of shared sense of identity um, you know loyalty in some ways people keep coming back every year to lead conversations um, you know not just around travel choices to and from that particular event or in and around live music, um, but in general. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, so the, the, the research from the, from the festival's research group at, at Cardiff University um, talked about talked about people that kind of experience, you know, strong shared emotions, joyful emotions, and how that can lead then to people reporting that they want to participate in activities that are sort of related to that experience. And, you know, I don't want to don't want to kind of overcook this too much about how profoundly life changing, you know, a particular gig can be. But on the other hand, I'm sure everyone on this call does have exactly that experience um, of live music, um, you know, being something that is, is, is a space where that there is a real sense of connection that's hard to hard to beat, you know, or hard to recreate in, in other situations, um, whether it's like a formative period of people's lives or once a year where a particular group of people gather together and you only see them then. These are quite powerful moments, I think. And in some ways, I think a lot of sort of traditional, by which I mean sort of charity NGO led campaigns, are trying to create this kind of idea of a, of a, of a shared, you know, shared sense of identity, um, which is often sort of pegged around a shared concern for climate change, which is obviously important and critical, but is almost more powerful if it comes from comes from comes from somewhere else. And if you can ground a climate campaign, a travel behaviour campaign um, in that shared experience and shared sense of identity, then that that is a really a real a really kind of powerful um, anchoring that makes. Um, whether it's behaviour changes or a desire to do something, do something else, voice a particular demand, links to the other recommendations here. I think it makes it makes those those campaigns more likely to succeed. And there's a really nice quote in the show must go on report, which I put on the slide here. It says it says it better than I can. Um, you know, and, and and really does underscore I think that cultural organisations, live music events can and should should be climate influencers. Um, and there's a unique opportunity to model the kind of world we want to see. The cultural codes, the values, the behaviours that we set together with our audiences can resonate long after they return home. Um, I think that's that's absolutely true. Next slide, please. Um, so, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna kind of stop for 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 Q and A and discussion um, shortly. And just from scanning the the chat so far, it feels like there's already some some great examples being shared of. Um, yeah, campaigns or particular travel initiatives that people have tried or seem to be working or reflect some of these approaches. That's brilliant. I think the more that we can be sharing these across the sector, um, you know, show what best practice looks like. Um, that's that's that would be a really excellent outcome of this conversation. Um, but just to conclude, I think um, I guess the underlying, you know, the underlying sort of offer here or or suggestion is that there is an opportunity to sort of merge what we know about climate public engagement research with this sort of almost uniquely powerful um, experiential sort of offer of live music um, where we are thinking about shared values, shared identities, shared experiences. Um, and there's a huge amount of potential there to really kind of catalyze um, campaigns, not just around audience travel, although it makes a lot of sense for the reasons that Kiara set out, Big, big part of events carbon footprint and it is a space where everyone's actively making decisions and has yeah has has a bit of individual buy-in um to the to the campaign but 
but but more widely than that as well and i think you know like every other sector like every other part of society the economy live music needs to cut its carbon footprint and to do it fast and faster um but like unlike most parts of the the economy and society there's this real real opportunity and climate change as julie's bicycle have been arguing for, for several years really needs culture in this regard i think we need things that connect with our heart and soul um you know to to to, to really sort of underpin faster faster change um faster engagement for the transition that's started but needs to go faster so there's an opportunity i think for live events to to not only look down at their own carbon footprint although that's crucial and shouldn't be skipped but to also look up and out um, and to think about ways which maybe this kind of climate communication research can help with to leverage their cultural influence um yeah and catalyze catalyze kind of the the, the, the public engagement we need to see on on climate change Thanks both. I think just to get us into the mood for discussion, we're going to run two quick polls as well um, and also give you a moment to reflect a bit on, on what we've shared. Um, so first, we're going to ask which one of the five recommendations you feel is most impactful to you. Um, so just a reminder that the recommendation one is ask your audiences to create change with you. Two is focus on collective efficacy and, and agency, what we can do. Three is finding and amplifying human stories that show the change. Four is focusing on fairness and feasibility. And five is building on that cultural credibility of live events to encourage legacy impacts. Um, I think you're all very active. There's still a couple of answers rolling in, but I think uh, we'll give it just a few more seconds and then we'll we'll share where we've gotten to. Um, I think we can probably share the results now, Bryony. Um, so, uh, as you can see, actually, we have a, a real spread um, of what has landed um, with everyone who is in the webinar today, which uh, I think is actually really brilliant because it, it shows that there is a huge amount of opportunity to work on, on different um, intersections between audience travel and, and live music and behaviour change. Um, and also because climate transformation really is one of those places where we need everyone doing all kinds of different things. Um, so yeah, we. it's interesting that in terms of impact, the focus on fairness and, and feasibility um, feels quite low or a little bit less exciting to people um, who are here today, but definitely across the board, a really nice spread. So I think we'll shift to the second question unless Adam or Bryony, you also had some reflection. But second question is, which one of the recommendations do you think is most feasible for you? for five more seconds and then share responses on this one as well. Great. So as you can see, again, a really nice spread of, of what people feel is feasible and you want to engage with. Um, definitely the, there is a bit of a, two leaders here in terms of focus on collective agency, what we can do, and finding and amplifying those human stories. Um, again, I think that focus on fairness and feasibility, uh, a, a little bit of a straggler there, although in some ways, I think as a recommendation, it also sort of sits across and weaves into all the other four. Um, so that, that makes sense. Um, so thank you so much. And we will move on to 
bit of discussion and Q and A. Um, so as a reminder, if you have any questions, um, do share those in the Q&A um, as we're waiting on you to get those together. I'm going to ask some questions as well. Um, so I think when we sent an early draft of the report for review, um, one of the bits of feedback that came back was to make sure that we aren't letting the industry off the hook too much, actually, in terms of what can be done. Um, especially speaking to that point of focusing on feasibility of making more sustainable travel choices. Um, so what are some of the things that live music event organizers can do? Yeah, so, I mean, I think as as, as Brian kind of said at the, at the top of the, the, the webinar, um, like, and it's a good, it's a good thing to always remind ourselves of as communications and engagement people like none of none of that matters if it's not attached to sort of you know meaningful emissions cutting things um and so i think there are you know there are some great resources out there like equilibrium have produced some really good kind of you know travel and event guidance um the tyndall center massive attack collaboration from a year or so ago that really kind of set out like a roadmap for, for properly low carbon live music are really good resources. And I think, yeah, like it obviously obviously means different things in in, in, in different locations, but I think like coach coach packages that that mandate a certain number of tickets um, from what we heard um, from 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 what Shambhala and other events that that do that have said has been really effective and I think um, sends a really good signal as well I think in you know in cities speaking as someone that just had my rear wheel stolen from my bike two days ago um, secure bike storage does really matter and it does make a difference um, and I think that um, like route, route planning depending on where things are as well you know route planning resources that really spell things out for people always about making the right choice as easy as possible <clears throat> as well as sort of plugging in all these um you know communications sort of guidance and suggestions making it easy um is is is, is really critical i think so 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 lots of things that lots of things that that are some some events are doing i think you know and, and doing some of but 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 i'm sure most would agree there's still space there to to really step up on lots of those practical things brilliant thanks adam and yeah i think we we did end up including a section in the report as well at the end with different examples of again how music events definitely can use both carrots and sticks to shape those choices and also, I think based on the conversations we were having in the roundtables, it was partly also looking beyond that because we've been having that conversation about the carrots and sticks for such a long time. And actually some of the same barriers keep coming up as well. It's like it's really hard to incentivize more people to use public transport if the public transport isn't running. Um, and so also focusing on, again, how do we look outwards to, to shift some of that feasibility and possibility to, to actually help people make better travel choices. Um, Please keep your your questions coming into the Q and A. Um, I'm just gonna ask one more question from you guys, and then we'll we'll switch to an audience one. Um, but I think speaking to that point about again working with local authorities, working with public transport providers, um, one of the things that we heard a lot during the roundtables as well was that those challenges for event organizers. Um, also getting caught up in industrial disputes. Um, and I think we have started to see some great responses from the likes of the Nighttime Industries Association and also live uh, really pushing for government to resolve these um, and make sure you know, transport's running, of course, without condemning the strikes because workers' rights are really important. Um, but most recently, the, the rail strikes announced for the 13th of December um, prompted Robert Smith of the Cure to tweet, 13th, no, Wembley, third night, what can we do apart from bring down the government in the next two weeks? Suggestions. So have we got any ideas for Robert Smith on that? I'm happy to, 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 to start that off, Bernie. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess strikes are supposed to be disruptive, um, but um, it does it does kind of, kind of underscore and emphasize that there is this shared um, shared space that you know the artists, promoters, events, audiences all have in common um, around the need to, in this case, be able to get to you know the the the, the gig, but in I guess more broadly in what we're talking about. Um, 
they need to be able to make where they can the most sustainable choice if they want to. And this speaks, I think, to Carly's um, question a bit in the in the in, in the Q and A as well um, around kind of yeah lobbying local transport services to operate later into the night as public transport ends painfully early and is unreliable um, in you know in in, a, in an urban context in the city context. Um, and I, I, I guess I guess that's exactly where that first recommendation is trying to get to is not giving um, a step by step answer of how that change comes about with an individual like transport provider or particular local authority. Um, and there's obviously a huge amount that goes into that in terms of um, relationships and local dynamics. But it feels like there is a chance to 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 mobilize you know the the, the collective sort of voice and, and muscle of of events plus audiences there um i think i think it 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 is definitely worth a try and it feels like there is there is an opportunity to collectively voice that that demand but it also that that is also getting audiences i think involved in reducing the carbon footprint of audience travel in a way that doesn't just immediately get down to kind of um try you know feeling like it's micromanaging people's behaviors so it feels like there is you know there is a productive space in there i think that that could be explored but it's i think it's a it's an offer or a suggestion to throw into the mix for people to pick up and try and run with or, or experiment with thanks adam and yeah i think um so carly's full question that's come through is how can the sector lobby local transport services to operate later into the night as public transport ends painfully early and is unreliable and I think um, there, in, in terms of the power of collaboration, one of my favourite examples is in, in Newcastle some years ago that the Newcastle Gateshead cultural venues um, came together and ran a joint audience survey um, asking people how they had travelled and if they hadn't taken public transport, again, why that was the case. And through that, one of the things that did come up very strongly was just the, the late night availability. But because they'd come together as venues, you know, it was, I can't remember, it was between 20 and 30 venues, I think, and, and they'd reached, you know, a good five figure number of audiences. And suddenly you've got that to open up those conversations and go, this is why people aren't using public transport. So it really strengthens, I think, that lobby when you when you come together. And I think there is a real opportunity there for, for the industry as well to, to strengthen some of the stories and, and conversations that we have as well in, in a policy context, like the recorded music industry historically has a very good track record of, of lobbying on things like copyright legislation because the industry's functioning depends on, on copyright. And actually, when we look at live music, you know, it, it hugely depends on the availability of public transport. And I think we could be going out there much more strongly to, to make that case on an economic level, on a climate level, on a on a human level as well, um, and a cultural level, yeah. Um, Bryony, did you want to add anything to that as well? Uh, no, I don't think so. Cool. Uh, one of the other questions that's come in from Cathy is, do you have any good examples of using personal or human stories specifically in the area of audience travel yet? So I'm happy to come in on that. So yeah, this was definitely something that came up in the roundtables that we held, um, some examples from that. And one of them we included in the report from Chris Johnson at Shambhala, actually, um, who said that the sustainability team actually interviewed some team managers um, and contractors and create short films um, highlighting how they were delivering sustainability at the festival. So it comes back to that thing about, yeah, putting a human face on the story. And um, yeah, Chris said it really ended up connecting with people and kind of strengthened that sense of um, it being a team effort. Um, so yeah, we thought that was a really good example and pulled that out and that's in the report. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to add, Adam. Well, I mean, it's just just, just to say that I think this is, this is um, a sort of journey that I think a lot of campaigners have gone on over the years as well to sort of move although obviously the emissions data matters it matters more kind of in the in the back end to be clear on like what is actually happening than it does on the front end as a communications tool um so you know those those human stories people that you can identify with as being similar to you or who are you know <laughs> don't have to be kind of grinning their way through a coach journey but are just clearly having having a having a reasonable time not not having a terrible time modeling the the you know the behavior that you're trying to get across like one of the one of the 
um, one of the things that I'm working on at the moment um, on another project is called the Local Storytelling Exchange. And it's all about um, sort of finding and amplifying stories, local stories of the green transition in action um, into sort of local regional media. Um, and the idea is, yeah, that it just sort of really breathes a bit of life, um, really sort of shows the social proof of, of, of what we're otherwise feel like we're campaigning about in quite a technical way or quite an abstract way um so the more that yeah the more that you can just um really really show and model and represent the the, the sort of direction of travel sorry no pun intended um that you want people to go in like that's that's going to always be i think more powerful than than using the the facts and figures which are important but need to sit probably out of sight mostly yeah, I think um, the, there was a time um, when a lot of the car sharing uh, apps were first kind of breaking into the market where I remember Go Car Share did a whole series of, of videos and interviews with people who had chosen to car share through the app um, and kind of filming their stories and journeys um, and the experiences that they had socially kind of meeting people that they would have never met otherwise, which was really nice. I think um, this is not so much from audience travel, but but Festa Republic Zero Waste Festival Goer campaign from a few years ago really focused on the, the stories of individual audience members and kind of the choices that they had made, um, both around, you know, not taking as so much stuff to site and recycling and everything else, and actually broadcast that on the screens at, at the festival in some cases to, again, kind of have, um, rather than the festival just being the messenger, um, actually have people and audience members speaking to each other and being messengers to each other, which was really nice. Um, so I think there's there's lots and lots of different opportunities to kind of explore that further and really focusing on that as, as part of um, messaging and, and campaigns. Yeah. Um, we have another question from Mark. Uh, food and drink at festivals can be expensive, so people often bring their own to reduce costs, especially if you don't have much disposable income. Too much to carry on a bus or bike, so you take the car. Any suggestions for how to overcome this challenge? Um, I can speak to that, but Brian or Adam, do you want to? Um, I'll jump in after you, Kira. Cool. Um, I think we, we've known for a long time, also in the context actually of, of tackling the amount of waste that's left behind at festivals, that, that how much people take onto festival sites uh, is one of the huge challenges. So um, different events have kind of worked on, on different types of solutions in the past, um, both again, some of it through information campaigns, actually sending people lists of what to bring or not to bring and, and telling them, you know, that the nightmare stories of are you really going to want to carry all this home uh, on Monday? Um, I think absolutely where where a real difference has been made is, is around um, shaping those choices that are available to audiences. So those bundled coach packages, for example, um, especially for festivals that, that are reliable sellouts uh, like Boomtown, like Shambhala, like Glastonbury sort of um, tying up, you know, a, a percentage of tickets to only be coach tickets means that you are effectively shaping those choices that are available to the audiences who are buying those tickets. Um, and I know, of course, uh, this, these are not necessarily always scalable, but definitely for festivals that are organizing shared bike rides which are a really nice social way though, to get more audiences to, to try out cycling. Um, I, I've definitely had a few friends who haven't cycled a lot in the past who then set themselves the challenge of going, well, I am gonna cycle to Latitude or I'm gonna cycle down from London to the Great Escape. Um, but of course those accompanied cycle rides do then um, also transport people's luggage for them. And um, there is a few festivals, there's, there's one in um, the Netherlands, um, uh, on Vleeland called Into the Great Wide Open. And again, because the majority of their audience comes from Amsterdam, what they have actually trialed is a pickup and delivery service for people's luggage um, so that they uh, can send things ahead of time. Um, in part, which ones of those solutions work really depend on the kind of festival you are, you know, how many audiences you're attracting and how far they're traveling. Um, but I think there are, there are various things that we can do. And I, I guess it also feels like it really does relate to the, the fairness and feasibility point in the report, like it's kind of what we're getting at. And I think this is just 
something that applies no matter the context not just in you know live music and, and travel campaigns it's like not everyone is equally responsible for changing their behavior or can or should necessarily do that um like and other people and the, i guess the classic is sort of with with flying you know like 15% of the population is responsible for about 70% of flights taken. That's the people where it is fair and it is feasible to ask and invite and suggest and campaign for those people to think about, you know, the choices they make because the choices they make really matter. Um, for other people, it, 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 it may not be appropriate and it may not, may not be reasonable to be asking people to do things. So the more that I think, you know, you can understand your audiences and really know who you are speaking to out of the, the, the variety of people that are attending, um, the, you know, the, 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 the better that, 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 that any campaign is going to land, um, because I think if it's a catch-all, you know, suggestion that everyone should do or the insinuation is that everyone could or should do it, you very reasonably get that kind of pushback of saying but 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 I can't and I you know it doesn't seem fair and I, I think being slightly sympathetic to that is the right way to go and focusing on the people that can and should change is the thing that is most effective. Brilliant thank you. Um, we have one last question that's come through the Q&A unless someone else has any last minute ones. Um, but someone has asked, do you think events need to be reactive to industrial action, such as strikes, um, which can often impede people making sustainable travel choices? Um, and also ticket insurance usually doesn't cover this. It feels like there are a lot of obstacles that usually divert people from making sustainable travel choices. Um, I, I think it's a I mean, it's a place where we we have to tread quite carefully, because, again, I, I don't think we want to get embroiled in the actual disputes per se, industrial disputes. And, and I think as, as an industry, we absolutely can and should be supporting workers' rights um, where we can. But I think, again, where I found it very heartening myself, again, to see people like Nine Time Industries Association and live as, as trade associations step forward and sort of call on government to find resolutions for these strikes because of the impact that they have on the sector. And I think there are absolutely ways to step forward and, and push for resolution and even support the strikes in terms of saying, well, can you reach a settlement? Can you fix this for us? Um, that, yeah, that, that I think would be really positive overall. Um, particularly as, I mean, one of the things that, that we also know, both from the roundtables and just otherwise, is that sometimes industrial action is also scheduled around major events um, because there is, uh, a recognition that that is when we're really dependent on public transport running. It happened during the climate change conference in Glasgow. Um, we've seen it happen again. One of the more recent rail strikes was was scheduled around Glastonbury. Um, so I think I think it's definitely important for us to be part of that conversation as a live music sector. Um, yeah, but in a positive and constructive way. Um, we've got another question that's come in. Uh, I think that's for you and Adam and Bryony. So on that sticky issue of audience members who are motivated to travel sustainably but can't easily because of structural barriers or infrastructure reasons, such as lack of coaches or bike spaces, is there communications advice you'd recommend for those people who want to see change? For example, who are the key gatekeepers they need to be reaching out to and what comms approaches can they use to approach them? Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess if it, if we're talking about people who are motivated to and can want to want to make sustainable travel choices, but they're not available, um, then I mean, yeah, some of that is looking back into events to to really just make those conditions as favourable as possible. I know it sounds like almost like a simplistic thing to say, but people can't make the right choice if those if those options are not available. And I think there are things like secure bike storage that really do you know provide for that. Um, but otherwise, it kind of goes back to this idea. I think that we're we're getting at in the first the first recommendation, where we're we're asking is there is is there an opportunity for for events and audiences to stand together? I mean, it looks it's going to look different in in in, in every case, I think, um, and and how that's represented to to different um, local authorities or different public service providers. But it 
but it does it it you know it, it does feel like that's good that, that is worth trying as a way to try and break that impasse where it's felt like it's difficult where people have reported that it's difficult to get that traction um but i think you know there's always this kind of um doing this kind of work like um what i guess what we're trying to do is translate as far as we can out from sort of quite general research into sort of sort of targeted focused ideas that that this you know particular group of climate communicators practitioners can use there's always then that next step with a particular event a particular crowd a particular audience where you have to kind of translate it again and say like well what does this mean like specifically for us in our context and not all of these will be relevant for everyone um but 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 um yeah i hope that hope that between these recommendations there's there's a bit of um motivation and like and and an impetus to try some ideas and i think i mean i think that's kind of as we as we as we near the end that's kind of our our invitation really isn't it Kiara? i don't know whether we want to we want to sort of lead towards the wrap up here for sure and i mean i think the last thing i would add on that as well is like don't underestimate the power of your voice as a particularly as an iconic venue or event um yourself like you know one of the things that always stands out to me is, is sometimes how just how rare it is also to find venues and festivals that really publicly step up on some of these issues. Like one of my favorite things, and I talk about this a lot, but it's um, the, the chief executive of the Royal Albert Hall actually wrote to Kensington Council in support of the temporary bike lanes that they put in and then threatened to strip because make, making that case that like this is really important for our staff it's really important for our audiences please can you reconsider and i think really speaking again to that position that we we hold or, or that you hold as as venues and, and events in your communities is really important um cool i think on that note we can wrap up uh do you want me to pull back a slide yeah, I mean, there's just like maybe just to sort of say, well, thank you. Firstly, thank you, everyone, for your time, for your time and like interest and also to, to the, some really great stuff being shared in the in the in the chat as well, like loads of really good stuff from Music Declares um, and lots of other people as well. Um, so the, the, the report is um, available to download from Julie's Bicycles website. Um, so please do dig in and do get in touch anyway um if you would like to um there's a form on my website adamcorner.uk which you can use to get in contact um or, or or email directly if you've got that already um and i think it's a there's there's a, you know this is this is a kind of it's a, it's it's an, it's an invitation to pick up and try some of these ideas um and if you want to talk about collaborating we'd really like to hear from you um from our side i guess like the next steps a sort of that we will we we're also going to be presenting this this work back into the car center the the car center's impact fund supported this work um and we'll get a sense of whether there's um you know interest there in potential future activities um that will be a conversation that we'll that we'll have after christmas and yeah i think kiara did you also want to add in anything that's kind of happening on on julie's bicycle side as well uh, yeah, just a huge thanks as well for, for everyone who's coming. Again, what, what we're doing with some of the findings is, is really picking up conversations um, with some people who are working a little bit more on the trade association um, and policy side to see what we can feed in um, to, to take that conversation forward. And in the interim as well, much like Adam, if, if there's someone who wants to follow up on, on anything, yeah, please do get in touch. Um, and yeah really look forward to seeing where we can take this next thank you everyone thanks everyone